So my name is Pedro Gonzalez. Uh, I'm from UC. I'm from Merced, where the UC is, born and raised. I've been a developer um, involved with CAS and Portal for the last seven years. Kind of a manager, and now I'm back into development. Um, I was also a member of the planning committee, and and Laura McCord. That you were going to talk about. Uh, so she's been a CAS portal developer for eight years. She's the, she is the chair of the planning committee uh, this year, and she has moved on recently to the director of user services at Whitewell. She's kind enough to join us today. So why did we uh, do this? So the first thing was when our campus was started in 2005, Communications asked uh, IT department to create a port lid in the portal such that um, they could assign rights to publishers and the publisher would be able to just go in, quickly type a message, and release it out to the community. It sounds like the announcement's port lit, and probably a good move back then would have been to extend the features or add functionality to the announcement's port lit, but they wanted something written from scratch. The kind of the differences are that instead of it being affiliate based, it was category subject based, um, the organization. Also, that we needed some really good support for Microsoft Word, which actually you know, has worked quite well. Um, and uh, there was also uh, the need for um, sending email after a couple of months. Hey, nobody's really going to the portal and looking at this content, so we'd really like this to be email to, to the community. And not just a, you know, a few people, but we email everyone in the community because by default we go ahead and let to subscribe them to every category we have, so any publisher writing a, a message usually gets 6,000 emails generated for the message. Um, about a year or two later, they decided to uh, bring up a, a calendar. We found that UC Berkeley uh, had produced a calendar. Um, they were willing to share it with us. We were going to do kind of this open source thing, but it didn't quite pan out. But it was a separate request, a separate system, a separate developer. Um, and then it was brought into my team as I became the manager. So I kind of had to leave both of those. So this is a screen capture of what the, uh, we call it the happenings portlet looks like. It's, this is the view of, of just the list of items. There's an RSS feed to references, so you can select what categories you're care to uh, join and also receive emails about, and here's what a detail page looks like with an iCal icon and a link. Um, again, this is about emailing messages out to the entire community. So if you're a new student, once you become, once you start your first day, you're now going to get these messages um, because you're automatically subscribed to every kind of And then up to them to go Another advantage is that, the, like in the announcements, the publishers, they just type it in. There's no approval process as long as they have access to the admin page. Uh, hit save and queue, and now it's going to go up within 15 minutes. Some of the issues is that copying from Microsoft Word hasn't been so great. Uh, there is a lot of complaints about how uh, Administrators, administration would copy in a message from Word, paste it in, and there was a lot of issues with formatting the Word XML stuff that sometimes just pop up. Uh, so that's something we were uh, we needed to remedy. And also, this thing's considered a spam bot because it literally, I, I look at the logs, and a message generally goes to just under 6,000 people every time it's created. And so it sends out a lot of email because usually there's about eight per day. Per day, and they're really not going to the targeted audience that, that should be receiving it. Another problem is our LDAP service wasn't so great, so the design could have been better on this little portlet. Every time we have a problem connecting to LDAP, it says, Oh, everyone's gone, and then a minute later it says, Oh, let's recreate everybody, which isn't too bad. Our campus is only about five, six thousand students, but now they've lost all their preferences, so by default, they get all the emails again, which they don't appreciate. And that's the situation.
And then this is a, a screenshot of our current events calendar. It's kind of homegrown. What happened was, um, is this the one? Yes, this is the one that Berkeley decided, wow, this is really a pain in the butt. Even though we wrote it, we don't like it. There's a lot of hard-coded entries in the middle of the code. And we put a lot of effort. You see Irvine also decided, uh, you know what? This really is not great code, so we're going to walk away as well. So when the main two, while the code wasn't that great, the two main issues with the events calendar is that there's no push, push notifications. So someone goes in, and an event is created on this calendar. Unless someone actually goes to the effort of going to the events calendar and looking up a particular calendar for a particular time, they're not getting this information. Um, there, the second problem, which is uh, more of a process problem, is whereas happenings, you can go and type in your message, hit send, the email's going to penetrate the community. Here, if someone wanted to create an event, they'd have to submit an email to the communications department. And they have someone there who literally will proofread, check for grammar, and whether they like the way things are worded, and will generally reject the first draft. So getting your event on the calendar is something like two to five days worth of back and forth via your email with communications. So that's been a problem. Um, as a result, we get all these events and happenings which really should be inside of our calendar system. So be workless calendar. So the first thing we decided is, since we're going to replace this events module, we'll go ahead and do our due diligence and see what's out there. But there wasn't anything even closely, or just remotely close to being work. Uh, there was a lot of homegrown applications that if we spend a lot of development time, we could get the feature set we want, or we could get the work and just configure the heck out of it until we got exactly what we needed. And that's what we ended up doing. So with a little bit of theming, now we have a nice events uh, uh, website, and that will be rolling out um, a soft launch in the next two weeks. We'll be trying out the, the uh, taxonomy, see how that is working, and then we'll uh, start looking at our um, major announcements to push for people to use the system. So at about the same time, uh, Laura being our core developer, uh, I wrote the Happenings Portlet a long time ago, back before I really understood any of the frameworks, and I was toying with it. It was something I was just going to kick up and throw away. It's horrible code. And, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. And uh, she looked at the problem. I said, we really need to rewrite it. There's a lot of issues with it. Uh, and she thought the best approach for it was to look at announcements, find what the gap was and then just go ahead and extend announcements or contribute back to the community. So that's a great idea, and I really like that. And then, you know, it kind of hit me. So hold on a sec. If everything, like 99.9% .9 of the things going into happenings, really should be in events, uh, why don't we put them in, in beat work, right? So again, thinking about the barriers, um, we, we need to address the process, but as long as we can find a way to take the events and email them out, to push notification out to the community, that would essentially replace happenings with Beadwork and a small little portlet. And we also want to integrate the calendar portlet into Beadwork so that the feeds come into the portal that way as well. And that's what we decided to do. And that's where okay. the technical expert takes it. Okay, so that's when I come in. So yeah, so happenings, about 98% of it was events. 1% of it was maybe announcements. Another 1% is, gosh, who knows. Um, so it was just kind of a mess. So we figured, you know, we have the calendar portlet that we're using. We have the announcements portlet that we're using. Is there some way that we kind of tie everything together, use these to manage you know, user subscriptions and announcements, and then bundle them up and send them through a newsletter. So, um, so that's what we did. Um, 
And I had consulted with Yale, because Yale has their um, calendar portlet with, uh, with beadwork. And um, theirs was a little bit different, and as I was tinkering, I was kind of making my own thing too. So, um, so anyway, so that's really how we, we got there. Um, so this is going to start getting kind of technical. Um, so in the existing calendar portlet, um, there was a number of areas that I went in and kind of either created or modified. Um, I created a whole new um, a new package for newsletter and bead work and, and did some modifications of some of the database um, uh, layer. Um, also, I uh, figured out Velocity, how to create templates, a newsletter template. So um, that was neat. So it's a lot of new technologies that I was never really familiar with, but I just kind of experimented on, um, including a Spring Grant batch. Um, with all of this going on, there was a lot of maintenance that you kind of have to consider. Um, you know, how are we going to um, collect all these users because not everybody goes to the portal. You know, you have new people. So, if I wanted to get their subscriptions, you know, sure, those people who logged in, a user account is created, and you know, we can we can get those. But what about people who don't ever visit the portal? Um, and then, you know, there's just all these things as you're going through that that have to be considered. So first, um, one of the things was trying to get all the bead work categories um, to display inside the calendar portlet. Um, and on top of that was we have to maintenance it. So what if bead work through there, you have your administrators creating, deleting, updating all these different calendar feeds. Um, you have to periodically maintain those because all of those subscriptions, I wanted to, to get those from you know, the portal database as they were subscribing to them. So I created a, um, a little groovy script that goes ahead and generates an um, XML document that contains all the feeds. And um, the feeds are... Uh, the URLs are created um, using a, a date span because with our uh, configuration with beadwork, you know, by default, it's only about 90 days of events that it shows and you can't, you know, just have a whole year because that starts becoming a little bit hard on the server. So um, we wanted to just kind of update that as, as we go along, so we create those uh, URLs. Um, then there's a way to go ahead and get the categories from BeadWorks. So this is a, a JSON uh, feed right here. So we have all these lists of, of, ca of categories. So this is what our basis was to then start producing um, the actual feed that we were going to use to pre-populate our predetermined pre calendars. Um, so right here, you know, we have the ID and title. We have the, the feed URL that, that we we create, um, and then the display. You know, that's basically if this is going to be a default calendar that everybody is going to be enrolled in, and then it'll be false if that's going to be something that's going to be optional. Um, and then we wanted to, to set in some roles and you know consider that you know maybe we only want to send a group of calendars to the staff versus faculty or to everyone. Um, so we, we keep that all inside of the portal calendar database. Um, so then looking at the newsletter uh, template. Um, so this is the template. It's just like a, a simple HTML file that you know contains like a loop that gathers all of our event data. So it's 
pretty straightforward until it starts to get into the part where it does the for each loop. So <laughs> if you're not familiar with that coding much, um, it'll just kind of traverse through your your um, objects to get all the different elements um, to output. And at the end, I'll show you what it looks like. So here's the, the newsletter package that we created. Um, this newsletter package, it's um, set up with the spring batch uh, scheduler. Um, so what happens is, you know, we, we gather all of our LDAP users, so it's connected through LDAP. Um, we collect all that information. Um, so that is stored. Um, then that's when we start generating, you know, the, the newsletter where we have we query for all the users and then we decide if the user exists in the portal database. Let's go ahead and grab all of their subscriptions. And if not, then let's go ahead and give them a default set. Uh, so, and then on top of that, you know, there's just a whole lot of, you know, let's make sure that we're we're updating these uh, feeds and URLs and so forth. Um, and then we have, let's see, the service that the newsletter service that um, gets called. Um, let's see, and then on top of that, we have, this is when we also kind of tie in our announcements. So calls to the announcements database tables are done, and then we figure out based on the user's role which announcements um, need to be sent to them. Um, as far as the scheduler, um, we have a little definition file um, that pinpoints like a little tasklet that pinpoints where our classes that we want to execute. Um, you could set it automatically um, using uh, the scheduled tasks, um, but I didn't do that, um, and, and maybe you could, I'm, I'm a little bit new to it, but um, since this portlet's going to be on all these load balance servers, if it executes, it's going to do it like six times or something on each server. So I just decided to run it on a cron job and just execute it that way. Okay, so then we have the actual beadwork package that um, includes uh, all the store feeds, it goes ahead and once you click the little edit link, the little gear at the top, it'll go ahead and collect all of those um, events. And so here's like a little look. So you have your academic calendar and academic events and so forth so that just kind of go, goes hand in hand with what you're passing through the XML document. So the interesting thing here is that as we add new categories, new, new uh, calendars to beadwork, they automatically pop up here as options. One of the nice integrations we like. Okay, so then we also have the database package, and with this, this is when we started integrating the announcements. You know, we, since we're doing this through the portal, we have direct access to all the announcements, database tables, so at the same time we can go ahead and grab those as they're accessible to us and get the events and, you know, just do your little updates and deletes and for the calendar um, items. Uh, the only thing that I had trouble with, and because I'm not that much of an expert of Hibernate, was that some of these queries I had to create using manual um, HSQL. Um, I couldn't figure out. It took me a little while to figure out why I couldn't do it the other way. So, um, so this was just kind of 
experimental and um, it's not yet <laughs> in production. But. Um, and then we have the controller. And the controller, that, that's pretty much the same with some revisions um, where, you know, when the little edit uh, gear is clicked, then you can go ahead and start executing your beadwork um, methods. So in the long run, at the end, with all the, the news uh, letter template, we end up with a nice little pretty uh, newsletter that gets sent out with all of the today's events, all the upcoming events, um, gathered from beadwork, and um, your announcements down at the bottom. So. <laughs> so the interesting thing here is some of the, you know, from the end user perspective, instead of getting a separate email for everything that's typed in, so you're getting 8, 10, 12 a day messages, now the idea is that through the modification, it will be by default added to a couple of related calendars that we think make sense for you. You can go ahead and add yourself to additional calendars, and then as their items are posted, feed work on the back end, Twice a day, we'll be sending out this kind of digest, nice little email, once in the morning and once probably right after lunch. Um, and that way, you're informed of the events for the next, what do we say, three to five days? Roughly. And that's very cool. So many days of the events that are, are on calendars that you're subscribed to. Also, announcements will also be uh, tossed up there as well. Uh, we're hoping to get buy-in from the publishers. Communications pretty much has an iron fist, so they can force this down. But we're trying to sell this as, hey, instead of you posting your event um, once, because of, through the current portlet, they get to post it once, and either they create a new message, which we really strongly frown upon, or you know, you just kind of time it where you think is right, which sometimes is an hour before the event, and then they complain that maybe if the email actually didn't go out on time, then they get frustrated. Here. It, we're encouraging them to post their events early, and that way the students or staff or faculty will be able to see their event. Maybe you know if they did three days before the event, or four or five or six times in these emails as part of this message. So that's the trade-off uh, we're looking at. Of course, the counter to that is, well, now I'm getting two emails of spam every day. Yeah, but that's a lot better than ten or twelve. So that's the idea. Now, and the okay. um, as far as the customizations with the calendar portlet, theoretically, you, it's not limited to just feed work. I mean, it seems like the trick is in the, the feeds. So if you're able to create a feed that kind of mimics the format that I have, then everything is going being updated inside the portal database database for the calendar portlet. So as long as your XML kind of matches up with what I've done, you can use anything I guess you want. But we thought this would be interesting and wanted to see if anyone was uh, would, would be interested in, in seeing this contributed back to the community because it integrates two of our products, right? Beadwork and, and new portal across the, the county portlet. And another thing, there's been a lot of movement in our communications portlets over the last year or two, driven by Drew Wills over at Unicon, and he wanted some kind of emailing feature. So maybe this is not the exact vehicle, but it could inspire some, some of the continuing points right now. We thought we'd share with you guys. Any questions? You guys use uh, Beadwork for everything else, like for personal scheduling? Not for personal scheduling. It's more for public announcements and events. And we are just rolling it out. So um, at this point, you know, we don't know what the adoption really looks like. We think uh, the key factor is email notification and um, making sure that communications now, or that's a feature we're leveraging with Beadwork. Before it was like the one person they controlled what actually was posted, and, and now we can defer that ability to uh, editors and people in control in the schools and the functional teams. So, uh, what kind of uh, 
how, how well it worked out for people subscribing to different prices to these public goods. You guys thought of that? In, in beam from WeWork perspective, we haven't really looked at how much mobile is going to be used. Our experience with the previous events calendar you know, system is that no one went to literally you know, 10 visits a day kind of thing. So we weren't so much concerned about people going directly to eCourt uh, web application so much as getting the emails um, and then possibly using the portal. So our portal is, is mobile friendly um, and they can drill down and, and look at the calendar events in the calendar portlet. But we'll, we'll probably seriously consider making it work mobile friendly as well. I just don't know if that effort is actually happening. Um, one of the things with the little portlet that I have uh, that we call happenings, because it's a real portlet and it shows you kind of a summary list of events, I can easily track when someone actually clicks on a link to find out the detail in there. Again, we're, we're, when we talk to the community, what we hear is, we hate happenings, it's a spam machine, I constantly get emails. And then they turn around and say, but it's the only way I really know what's going on with the campus. And every time we try to get rid of it, there's a big uprising of people saying, no, no, I need to get that email. That's how I figure things out. With that being said, again, 6,000 emails at a time for event. Uh, if I look at the counts, I don't think I can log in right now, I don't want to trust this wireless, but um, uh, it actually going to the portal and viewing the detail, uh, we have something like three to 10 hits. 10 hits is like a very active post that someone's really going to the portal. No one really uses the portal to view these, it's all about email component. So that's why we thought it was critical to have that to really make the work a success, which is what we want. How often do you send out the emails again? For for this yeah for this change this will be twice a day is what we're looking at doing it will be it's configurable so uh, we're thinking first thing in the morning to pick up anything that happened the previous afternoon and evening uh, we do have a significant number of staff that like to start at seven to seven thirty because of our parking constraints um, and then another one after lunch for the actual post that happened early morning that's what we're looking at. Uh, we, we are going to have our communications team go out and kind of feel the pulse of the community and find out what's the preference, and they're going to drive a lot of this for us. I was going to say, you know, depending on how how active your events, you know, if you have people waiting until the same day to post an event or post something, that seems to be a problem on their end. Yes. You know, I, I would think you'd be able to you know, reduce it to one a day, if not once a week, which would eliminate that filling or spam. But then that would, you'd have to enforce the idea that if you want an event to be announced, you have to have it in, you know, five days ahead or, you know, a week ahead. Yeah. You can speak a little bit to that. We run a similar service, which we deem, we call it morning mail, even though it's not exactly what it is, uh, which was the name that was coined by Brown University. We do the same thing. The Beaverton calendar that we run is a uh, simple repository for events. I don't really expect people to visit the calendar itself, but people do. Um, it's more for disseminating things. And just like you have your happens uh, your mailing list, we had a old mailing list years ago that used to basically be the trash can for everything. You know, just this repository that you dump things into. We created a service instead pulled from news feeds from the events, which we found also were about 90% of everything that people posted. Very, very similar uh, experience. But, and I hand this to Gary Schwartz, who's the guy who insists on this. We started with a three week window where the events would get pulled into the outs outbound system. We never refresh, at least up to that point. And that was mostly both a political choice and, at the time, a, uh, a technical choice to not go back and re import the data. So if something changed, I thought three weeks myself was a little bit long. Right. But you know, two weeks was probably was what I voted for, but I got overridden. If people don't get their event in the calendar within three weeks for something that's upcoming and it changes, they have to notify us and we'll we'll make changes. And what that has done is that it's forced uh, a certain amount of discipline across the campus 
through a very simple, you know, uh, the guy who implemented this would usually say, oh, no, no, we, we can't, we can't re-implement that stuff. It, whether that's true or not was not an issue. Yeah. It was a choice. And um, what we found is that in the first six months, people would whine and complain, ah, my stuff is changing. I, you know, I just found out an hour ago I have to change the vineyard. Like, really? <laughs> Why are you doing that to, to people who are going to attend your events? Right. Do you really want people to come? <laughs> you know? And so, little by little, that all kind of ironed itself out. And so by setting a policy like that, which seems politically impossible, we were able to fall back on, oh, it's technically hard, right? Um, a little bit of hand waving. We were able to actually get people to be more disciplined about what they did. Great. That's, that's good to know. I'll take that back to communications. Again, uh, what, what, what was interesting about this and why we're just now combining the two now is that um, the requests were coming from different areas of communications, even though it's a very small unit, and uh, they, they just were never integrated, and they're not on the same page. You know, again, one side, it's let them blast email anytime, you know, five minutes before the event, and that does happen. And there's complaints like, I need this email to go out in five minutes. Um, I'm sorry, you know, I can actually do it, but, uh, you know, like, well, you know, there's a window there. And if it's the chancellor, yes, we're going to push it. But she has other methods to get out urgent messages. And that's what I tell everybody to do. If you really need to be that, uh, control the message that much, get a mailing list that hits everyone you need to. But for this uh, effort, I think we're going to look for about three to five days. But you're right. It's, um, it's something about discipline. And we'll see how it goes now that we're combining these two efforts. We're really excited about it. I'll play a secret when our president calls us a citizen. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't I, I don't think there's a question as to whether or not that happens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. right, what what uh, version of people are you guys using? Was it 3.9? That's a great question. It is 3.9 currently. Yep. So we want to upgrade. The one We had some issues with our beadwork install because the version of JBoss with 3.9 that was out there and been out for a while, there was a security issue and it's not patched. It's um, patched now. It, it is now. Great. It has been patched for, for quite a while, but I think there was a gap. We had patched all the 3.8s, everything had gone out, and somehow we. It's the 3.9. We released a, a good 3.9, and somehow we hit a window where we released a 3.9 that had a bunch of stuff in it that wasn't supposed to be. Uh, okay. Our bad. Gotcha. Our bad. And when people were like, hey, dude, what's up? We're like, ah! So we, we fixed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had a security issue around that. Someone hacked into the box. And then that, even though that was a dev system, we, we do private public keys for a lot of things, like GitHub and other networks. So now I'm hearing dirty laundry. And our developer was frustrated because of some firewall rules. So he not only had his public key on that server that was compromised, but a private key. And so and then there's this cross access once you get in those VMs. Uh, it, nothing really happened, but it was like, oh my god, OK, let's review our security issues. Let's lock down feed work. And it kind of delayed our the, you know, the a little bit. But no, no, no. It, it was all about knowing what the security landscape looks like. And so we, it was curious that we just started scanning a bunch of our VMs and servers that week, but we had already found out that there was an issue. Actually, that was a VM we had at Berkeley, and they automatically scanned things, and they told us quickly. So that was nice. We were a little shocked about that, actually, especially because we had been so so careful for so many years, and then we had this one, you know, like, how did stuff get back in? Yeah. I can assure you that the current one is cut out. Excellent. Well, I think I heard the bell. So if there's no other questions, I think we'll wrap up this session. All right. Thank you for attending. We appreciate it.